Because you can fake for a long time, but one day you're going to show yourself to be a phony. That's for true. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what these, you know, a lot of people are doing these days. Watch people. going into that underclass structure starting in about another two years. Once we go into it, we'll be locked and frozen in it by the year 2013 or 2010, that general time frame. You got, we got, all of us got about two years to either get our act together or hang it up. If we don't do some very specific things in that next two year period, we will not get out of it and winter's gonna close on us. Now, what's, what, what's gonna drive us into this underclass structure? First of all, are the legacies of slavery and Jim Crowism. We are still bearing the burdens and the scars. They were never corrected. That's one of the failings of our leadership in this country. They had the nerve, the audacity, to let black folks suffer for 460 years. And at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, rather than going back and saying, let's find out what has happened to black folk for 460 years. Have they been psychologically, emotionally, politically, educationally damaged? Nobody spent one minute of time trying to figure out what had happened to black folk over all that period of time. So in the course of the civil rights movement, the end of it, they say, well, let's pretend that nothing has happened to them, that they were not injured, they were not hurt, and now let's go seek integration and pretend that we're all equal. Now that was grossly unfair, because by that point in time, in about the 1966 period, Whites have become economic giants in America. They own and control everything at that point in time. Black folk didn't own anything. Whites control almost 100% of all the wealth, the income, the privileges, the businesses, the resources, and all levels of government. Blacks had nothing. Blacks were one-foot midgets. And they allowed us then to use integration to walk from our communities, from our ghettos, over in their communities. Totally disarmed, not understanding anything, blind, naked, and then saying that you can go and compete. Compete with what? And that's what's happening in South Africa right now, where you have black folk now who have been totally subject, subjected to the most brutal form of, of legal and economic slavery around the world for almost 300 years in South Africa, where whites in South Africa control almost 100% of all the gold mines, the diamond mines, the chrome, the bauxite, the magnesium, the land, the businesses, the farms, the animals. And now in South Africa, they've been told that they're free. Now, anybody in his right mind would have said, hold it a second. Now, if there's been a reform in South Africa, since whites have gotten everything and blacks got nothing, you should have seen on the news a massive flux of whites trying to get out of South Africa. If there's going to be any significant real change, wouldn't you agree? Somebody would have been trying to get out of there. The airports would have been jammed. And you all haven't heard a peep. You know why? because nothing is changing. Because in South Africa, the dominant, arrogant white society that's been so brutal to black folks still owns and controls 100% of all the gold mines, diamond mines, silver mines, chrome ball site. And they're telling those South Africans, you can now compete. And that's the problem in black America. We've been told now that we can compete, and I say, well, with what? And uh, by going into our underclass structure, going to be seven fact converging factors going to push us. To get my little summary up, one, we're going to have an increased amount of conservatism in the country, and I'm going to talk about conserv conservatism in a few minutes. Two, we're going to have a massive unending influx of immigrants into the country, going to push us down. We have been the number two population in America now for over 460 years. We're going to get kicked out of being number two and going down to number three. When are we going to go down to number three? We're going to go down to number three in less than two years. Now, when I wrote my book uh, number, about four or five years ago, Hispanics at that time were 9% of the population. They've now moved in, in six years from 9% up to 11%. Blacks were 12.3% six years ago. They're still at 12.3%. Now you got a Hispanics at 11 and blacks at 12.3. According to the Census Bureau two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., they anticipate Hispanics passing blacks right on time, as I had predicted. Now, Wall Street Journal, the left-hand column two weeks ago, on the left-hand side of the page, I can send it to you if you want, it says that when Hispanics passed black people, at that time, 
the whole political structure will shift gears. There'll be a power shift in America. That nobody's going to go to black folk to ask them anything anymore because you're no longer the dominant minority population. They are already preparing for this. They're already creating all kinds of major programs around the country where you were, they would go and check with Hispanics about anything they want to know about minorities. Black folk would get their information through the Hispanic society. Then by the year 2005, the Asians are going to pass black folk. Then you're going to get kicked from being number three down to number four. At that point in time, you're locked in and frozen because everything you need you have, you have, will have to pass through those two groups. And those two groups do not have your interest at heart. They don't understand your problems and don't care about it. If you can't compete, they're going to say, that's tough. And so what we're going to try to do today in dealing with that's just that one issue, as well as conservatism and the problems of technology in America that's also going to make us push us in the underclass, is to teach you how to compete. We got to understand we got these problems, but you got to understand where the problems came from. And I want to give you a real fast education today, because the real cue, the real clue to liberation is ed not only education, it's re-education. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I'm going to show you how we got into our dilemma and how we got out of it, how we must get out of it. Nothing has happened to black folk by accident. Everything that's happened to you has been systematically programmed to what I call social engineering. You are a victim of historical social engineering. Now let's go back and start dealing with some of these issues. <laughs> and a lot of this what you also find covered in my book, Black Labor, White Wealth, and the other two books I got coming out this year, one is called Dirty Little Secrets, and, the, other, and the, the big one is called Powernomics. How do you do it? And Powernomics, if you want to know what Powernomics is, because I'm going to talk about it a little later, Powernomics is teaching my people how to, a new way of seeing, thinking, and behaving. And that's what the whole thing will be about this morning. You've got to change the way you're seeing, and thinking, and behaving. Why? Because I said we've been locked into an underclass structure, because we've got two major problems in America. One problem is that maldistribution of wealth and resources that I told you about that's in South Africa and America where whites own and control everything. That's your number one problem. The second problem we're going to talk about this morning is the inappropriate behavior pattern of black folk. Those are the only two problems you have. I don't care what anybody else talks about in America. It's not worthwhile wasting your time. The problem in America is not drug abuse, crime, low-income housing, public housing, food stamps, welfare, teenage pregnancy. Those are symptoms of a problem. The symptoms are the fact that you don't own and control anything to run you and control your lives. That's the problem. And the second thing is inappropriate behavior pattern. And before I get into the inappropriate behavior patterns, let me define that for you. Now, I'm, in current day terms, I might call it the, the, uh, the, Rod, uh, the Rodney King syndrome. It's pretty for me, most of you. That's when somebody pulls you out of a car, breaks your jaw, breaks three ribs, cracks two, knocks out two teeth, gives you a concussion, breaks your wrist, breaks your kneecap, and stomps you, and you say, why can't we all get along? That is inappropriate behavior. <laughs> or if I'm in Detroit, Michigan, when I, was serving, when I was there functioning as an assistant police commissioner during the riots, and I was working on riot uh, possibilities and techniques in the city, I get a call down to by some people who had been involved in a couple of murders. And he said, look, I didn't have anything to do with it, Anderson. I, I, I just there, I witnessed it. I said, what happened? <clears throat> well, you see, they'd had a disturbance in Detroit, Michigan. and. Uh, and the police broke into a motel and found uh, two black boys in there with some white girls. And they didn't like that, even though they were in a, in a black neighborhood. They had paid for the, for the room. It was their right and privilege to be wherever they wanted to be. It was between them and God. But the police officers were white. They were very disturbed about this. So what they did, they took those two boys on a Friday, and they beat them all day Friday. And they beat them all day Saturday. Then by Sunday, they had gotten tired of beating them. They said, well, we just go ahead and kill them. And so one of the officers picked up a rifle, stock, a rifle, and hit the oldest black kid in the back of the head with a rifle, and the kid was only about 22 years of age, hit him so hard that it knocked one eye completely out of socket and bulged the other eye and broke the rifle stock. And the poor kid fell on his knees and crawled around and found a broken stock in the rifle, and on his knees held it up and apologized for having a hard head. That is inappropriate behavior. The question should have been, why are you brutalizing me and killing me? What have I done to you? And so that's the kind of inappropriate behavior 
It's what we've been systematically programmed into displaying as black folk in a very highly competitive society. So what I want you all to start thinking about today and all throughout my speech today is not who you're against, but who you're for. I want you to understand that you're in a very highly competitive situation. You're going to be competing to survive and prosper. And that's what racism is all about. Contrary to what anybody tells you, and I just saw a definition of racism in, 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 the, Wall, in the New York, I mean, in the Washington Post last week by a noted columnist who's a conservative. And what he was really talking about was prejudice and discrimination. He wasn't talking about racism. But he was mystifying the word. That's why I, I finally figured out why he's always on the wrong side of an issue relating to black folk. He thinks that a black person can be racist. A black person cannot be a racist. Racism is a power relationship between groups of people. That's all it is. It means where one group of people have control of so much wealth and power and resource that it can deprive, hurt, and injure and exploit another group to benefit itself. Never in the history of this earth have black folk ever controlled that much resources in the, in where they can have gone out of their way to exploit, injure, and do something to whites. So therefore, racism only started in the 16th century when you began to commercialize slavery against blacks. That's when racism started. There was no such thing as racism before that. The other thing, and, and before I get into my presentation, you got to understand racism also comes from the word race. Race means group. So whenever you hear people talking about now, uh, you cannot prove racism because somebody fired you from a job, they are absolutely right. And the power structure and all the white think tanks in Washington know that. That's why you can no longer prove racism. Because racism does not apply to an individual, it applies to a group. And because I discriminate against you, that's individual, that's personal. It's not group-based, and so you can no longer prove group-based discrimination. The second thing about the word race, remember also, which is very important for our discussion today, is the word race means being in competition. See, they didn't pick, they didn't pick house, tree, car. They said racism. Race means being where people are competing from here to there. And we are in competition. That's what racism means. Black people must learn how to compete or survive and survive or not compete and perish. And so this morning, we're going to start talking about what we got to do. Now, let's go back to when all this, when everybody said, where did this start? Let's go back to where it started. It all started, it all started in Africa. And as I go through all this, I want you all to keep some points. I'm going to stick my finger up and remember those points. Those are the points that are going to be hurting us today. Those same points I'm going to articulate to you today. Now, all this started in Africa. Let's say about 1441. There was a guy called Henry the Navigator who went around the coast of Africa and he found some slaves and traded some slaves off. And he brought them back to Europe. And he took them back to Europe and he gave them to the Pope as gifts. And the Pope and the Catholic Church were so beautifully uh, appreciative of these slaves that he then said, since you've given me these slaves, what I'm going to do now is award you 300 miles of the coastline of West Africa, which is now called the Gold Coast. So Henry the Navigator was given land by the Pope, the Catholic Pope, and the Catholic Pope didn't even own the land. But he gave him all the rights of 300 miles of coastlines of West Africa. Say so it belongs to you. That was in 1441. And so this, and, and Henry the Navigator was a Portuguese. So he began to then to try to encourage other Portuguese to go around there and try to find some more slaves. So this is a good thing. We, we own all that land around there now. By 1487, the Pope then said, aha, uh -huh. so many people began to pick up slaves. He says, what I'm going to do now is put out a public declaration and officially declare slavery to be a legitimate enterprise. And the Catholic Church was the first one to do it. Now, why is this important? Because you see, up until that point in time, slavery was never based on skin color. Slavery was based on three things to, be a, to put you into slavery. One was an indebtedness where you owe somebody something and not paid at all. Two was that you was through religious persecution. Or three, you were a prisoner of a war or a conflict and you were now a captive and they were forcing you into labor. Those were the only three reasons you could get into slavery until the Catholic Church put out this declaration. And now they added a fourth variable which says color is now a factor. Now that's very important because, now, because the Catholic Church now had in previous slavery, in earlier parts of the, of the century, I mean, uh, 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 let's say immediately after um, 
Christ was born, the Catholic Church played a very pivotal role in saying, as a religious institution, we got an obligation to even to represent those who were enslaved. And the Catholic Church set up a system that they would go through, whether it was a Greek slave or a Roman slave, they looked after the rights of the enslaved, protected, saying that even if you're a slave, there are certain things that people cannot do to you. The Catholic Church accepted that responsibility. Now the Catholic Church now has condoned black enslavement based on skin color. That was totally different. But also, the first thing they did, they abandoned any interest in representing the interests of the enslaved, even though they had done it for everyone else. And all of a sudden, the problems began to develop in Africa. Other religions began to join in. So people say, well, Dr. Anson, how are you able to enslave us? Because we were doing some things wrong in Africa. As the other religions joined in to start enslaving blacks, so did other nations, so did other ethnic groups. And black folk were totally ill-prepared to deal with it because we had been making, doing some things wrong in Africa ourselves. See, going back to about 765, the Muslims had been trying to get into Africa for the longest because they'd heard about all the gold and silver and the wealth in Africa. And the Muslims had been going around, the Arabs had been going around Africa trying to conduct holy wars against dark-skinned people to get access to the resources. And starting in, 1760, in 765, not 17, but in 765, the Arabs started enslaving black folk. They, slaved, they enslaved on an average of one million blacks every hundred years and shipped them out of Africa. So now if you start to count from 765 up to the present day, that's over 1,300 years. That means over 13 million blacks have been shipped out of Africa just by the Arabs alone. And the Arabs are still shipping blacks out to slavery. If you go to Ethiopia and uh, um, Mauritania, you now find, in Sudan, you still find blacks being sold by Arabs with actually about $475 a piece. So Arabs have been selling blacks now for over 1,300 years. So by, but when you get around to 900, though, a few years, at, 200 years after that, uh, the Arabs are still trying to penetrate the blacks to get their wealth. And uh, blacks have gotten a national, got an international reputation being one of the wealthiest nations on earth, talking about walking on streets of gold. And so from 900 up until about 1400, they, get, they live reasonably well because people were afraid to penetrate Africa because blacks also had a ferocious uh, reputation for being invincible fighters. They were scared of the jungles and the black warriors. So no one went into Africa to get them, but the Arabs were still trying to get in, get access to the wealth and resources. Now I'm back up to the 14th century again. Now in the 1400s, about the same time as I just told you that the Pope declared uh, that officially that blacks can be enslaved, at the same time Timbuktu was invaded by the Arabs. They finally broke through. They broke through because, see, blacks at that time had three major empires, Ghana, Saul, uh, Mali, and Songhe. They were the richest, richest nation on earth, but the black leadership had set themselves up to be invaded by the Arabs and consented to be pimped because the black leadership was extremely naive, going around practicing what I call benign slavery. Every time anybody came into an African nation, like Mali, Songhe, and, and what they were saying is that, well, I'll do business with you, but you gotta buy one of my slaves. And the slaves were their own people. And they were playing games with slavery, saying, well, it's a tribe, he's a different tribe, so I'll enslave him. But the slavery that blacks were practicing was not the same vicious kind of slavery that came later. But the fact that they were playing with it, condoning it, and willing to sell their own black folk out naively. Now the question becomes, why were they doing it? Okay, why were they doing it? They were doing it trying to impress people with their power, how strong they were, saying that I would do business with you, but let me show you how strong I am. I got three or four blacks in the back room and you buy them from me. And then I'll sell you some gold and silver. And people were but what people were impressed with was not really their power. They were impressed with the fact that you had absolutely no interest as a leader in your own people. And felt no responsibility to their welfare. And so when that got out then, all those countries that I said once the Pope condoned slavery, they began to flow into Africa because they knew the black leadership did not feel the strong togetherness 
the willingness to protect their own people and to look out for them and lead them and will willingly sacrifice them so Africa be fell wide open. And people poured into Africa after the Pope declared slavery legal in, 14, in the 1480s. By 1500, between 1500 and 1650, 150 years, they hauled out five million blacks just to Central America alone, just right south of here into, into Mexico and to Central America, Costa Rica. Just to give you an example, after the Pope declared that you can legally go after those blacks, they pulled out five million of them and sent them in there. And those blacks, in 150 years, with sticks and stones, not other steam shovels, but with sticks and stones and rocks, dug out over 16,000 tons of silver and 400 tons of gold just to enrich Spain and Portugal. And this was critically important because at that point in time, Africa was a rich continent, had all kinds of wealth. And Europe was an impoverished nation. Europe was run over with crime, sickness, disease, illness, disorganized. Africa was the, was the glory of the world. But you see, our people were playing around, not looking out, taking care of the business of their people. At that point in time, all these nations say, aha, we know how to strengthen Europe and rebuild Europe. And that's by displacing the wealth out of Africa and displacing not only the, the, the material wealth, but the human wealth of Africa. So they began to pour in and started sucking blacks out of Africa. Not only the black treasures, the gold, the silver, but also the human capital. In some areas, they almost depopulated parts of Africa by shipping blacks out. And over a course of um, about another 300 years, they shipped out somewhere between 25 and 30 million, 35 million blacks. And out of all those blacks that shipped out of Africa, over two thirds of them died en route trying to get here. As a matter of fact, from, from, the, from the 1500s to 1800s, six out of every seven people that were shipped across, the, came across the Atlantic Ocean were black folk. Six out of seven were blacks. And they were depopulating Africa, not only as wealth, as resources, but as human capital. Very important. And as they came into the, and as they shipped them out, everybody began to become enriched. But you still had black leadership that still didn't understand, unwittingly was playing into the hands of people who were much more serious about the games than they were. So I jump up to the year 1619, they brought in 20 blacks into America, formally, even though we'd had another group of blacks in here around in the 1500s, they'd been floating around too in the, off of PD River in South Carolina. And we'd ever had blacks much earlier, the Folsom people, but let me don't even get into that. But by 1619, they brought in 21 blacks into Jamestown, formally. And those blacks came in as indentured servants. They were traded by a British, I mean by a, uh, a German a warship for supplies. Those, those blacks were free in about the year 1624. But something very important happened right before 1624. In 1621, you had a black guy named Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson came to the United States in 1621, came in from England as a free black. At the same time, you had those other 20 black slaves brought in here in 1619, the first 20 blacks. But this black came in as a free black in 1621. He came in, and then since he was coming in from England, not from Africa, he then declared himself a free black, declared that he wanted head rights. And head rights in those days says anybody coming to the country can get 640 acres free right off the bat. Then plus you can get another uh, five, 600 acres for every slave that you own. He immediately went and got, had 13 blacks. He brought in then, we got him 13 black slaves. And he, he's black. So within a few years, about 15 years, he was one of the richest blacks in the colonies. But he was enslaving his own people. Now, going up to 1638, Maryland Colony then put out a public edict that laid the cornerstone for racism in this country, saying, that now that black folk were coming into this country and they began to intermingle with whites and socialize like Johnson and trying to, trying to integrate, we ought to pass a new law. So the state of Maryland put out a law called the Doctrine of Exclusion. The Doctrine of Exclusion says that no black should be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. That was in 1638. Now Johnson was still had it, still had it, he's really built up his land now. He had all kinds of land and a whole bunch of slaves, getting close to about 70, 80 slaves now. 
And a white guy went over to one of his plantations. And, he, and, he, and one of the black slaves there, named John Castor, asked him, says, uh, why am I a slave here with this guy? He says, I didn't know that, he says he owns me for life. How does he own me for life? And the white fellow who was a plantation owner also said, look, he doesn't own you for life. You know, didn't you, didn't you contract for indentured servantship? Indentured servantship normally runs five or seven years. What do you mean he's got you for life? This black guy said, I've been working for this, for this Anthony Johnson, this, this black slave plantation owner, for almost 27 years. The guy said, well, just run off and leave. Forget about him. You don't have to keep working for him. So the, so the, so, so the black slave, John Castor, ran off. But guess what happened? Anthony Johnson then went to court, and he sued the white plantation owner who had encouraged the black to run off. Sued him in court, and the court accepted Anthony Johnson's claim against this black slave, saying that he owned that slave for life. Now, what happened there never had ever happened on the history of the earth with black folk and in this country, where all of a sudden a person laid claims against an individual for the rest of his entire naked life. And it was a black man. And once, it, once that court decision was made, whites picked it up and said, aha. So by 1665, all the states then started passing in slave law, enslavement laws. They went back and took the doctrine of exclusion and say, now, the doctrine of exclusion with Maryland says that black folks shall always be excluded and never be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. But after listening what, to the court decision for Anthony Johnson, we got a good thing going now. So they took, they took that same doctrine and expanded it. And now the doctrine says that not only should black folks be excluded, subordinated, non-compensated, non-competitive managed workforce for the personal confidence and wealth building of white society. That became the enslavement codes, both explicitly and implicitly. And all the states began to enact it then, based on, on Anthony Johnson's ruling in court that he owns a, a black, another black person for life. Now the system picks up. We jump now up to about 17, until 1704. 1704, there's a black kid there are a whole bunch of slaves coming in from Africa on a, on, a, on a slave vessel called the Eagle. The Eagle is heading towards America. There's a young black boy on there, along with some other, along some other uh, older slaves. The slaves decide to revolt on the ship. And they took over and knocked the captain down, took over the ship, and took the weapons, and we're going to try, and we're in a fight to take over the control of the ship and head it towards, uh, back towards Africa. And as one of the older slaves grabbed a, a machete, and he said he's going to kill the captain so they can completely have control of the ship, as he swung at the captain, a young black slave jumped up and got in there and protected the captain and took the blows himself, which chopped off one of his arms and protected the captain. And by protecting the captain, the captain was able to recover the control of the vessel Put, all, put down the, the, the insurrection, and it then hung all the blacks who were trying to revolt, except the young black kid who was only 19. When the captain got to America, he gave him to uh, supposedly a benevolent slave owner and rewarded him with recognition and says that after he's been, been educated and recovered from his wounds, that he's to be set free. And again, this young boy, he placed more importance on protecting other people than getting his free people out of a dilemma. But he was rewarded and recognized for it. And he personally benefited at the expense of his own people. That was in 1704. 1705, the colonies said, what we need to do now is pass slave codes so we can regulate slaves' behavior, period. Slave codes were passed to tell you exactly how every black person must act in America, what he could not do, and what every white person must do to make sure black folks stayed in line. Then they passed another law at the same time with it, which is still in effect today. It was called the Diversity Act of 1705. You all call it multicultural and cultural diversity. You all understand what I'm saying to you? I want you all to understand history. If you ever want to figure out how to get out of your dilemma, 
Never spend your time trying to work with anything unless you know how it got into place. And then you take it out of place. The multiculturalism and cultural diversity started in 1705. They passed a law at the same time saying, how do we control black folk now? They said, now that we got all these blacks coming to the country, we got a good thing going. They said, because now all over Europe was being advertised, if you want to become wealthy and powerful, go to America. We guarantee if you go to America, we give you free land and free labor. You'd have to be an idiot not to get rich. You don't have to do anything. We'll give you all the land you want and all the, all, and, 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 you, and England started a franchising system, so which means even if you couldn't afford to buy slaves, we, we had a franchising concept, which means England would give you the land and give you the slaves, all you do is pay them a commission. Just like McDonald's and Burger King, that's where the whole franchising concept came from. It was from England with slavery. And so people rushed into this country, but they had to set up external controls saying, how do we control them when they get here? With all these blacks coming into the country, because I just told you six out of every seven persons coming across the Atlantic were black folk. They were pouring into the country, but they want to make sure enough whites are here to benefit and get the fruits of black folks' labor. And so they passed the cultural diversity, which says, the cultural diversity law says, for every five blacks you own, you must have one white person. You must always have one white person there to monitor, to make sure that black folk are being monitored and kept under control, that you understand what they're up to. That law stayed into effect, never went out of effect. Now, come 1710. Now, when 1710 came, here's the main point of my talk today. 1710 did something that is totally devastating, totally devastating. The Virginia colony in 17 passed what they call meritorious manumission. Meritorious manumission says, what we're going to do now that we put up the external controls in 1705, we must have internal controls. We don't have the time to go around and monitor and watch all these black folk coming into this country. We must build in some kind of inter internal management control. We must build in a way like the Rodney King syndrome, that kind of thing. In it, we must build into black folk an inappropriate behavior pattern. We must teach black folk to see things upside down in a non-realistic manner. And what they did very systematically was like taking glasses and painting pictures on it upside down. And we found out in laboratories in, social, in sociology and psychology that even if you paint the world upside down for a person to put glasses on their eyes, we found that the subjects can learn to live upside down. They learn how to adjust learn how to adjust their reach and what they're doing. And we watched it over and over again in experiments with young people in school, where we paint the pictures upside down and say, what, what, what do you see? And the mind has the ability to flip things back over to where, it becomes, where the reality becomes the unreal. That the unreal becomes the reality. And once you do that, you got your people nailed to the wall. So meritorious manumission came into effect in 1710 and says, we will pay, I mean, we will reward, we will recognize, we will set free. Any black person does one of four things. One, if you in fact will save a white person's life. I told you about the young man with the, on the boat with the eagle, you know, five, six years before that. If you save a white person's life, you will get your freedom. Two, if you protect a white person's property. Three, if you invent something that a white person can make wealth and power off of, some kind of an invention. And four, if you in fact will squeal on, inform on, or tell on your own people. That was called meritorious manumission. Now, you all might say, why is that important? I'm going to tell you, that, that was so devastatingly important. And the reason it was so important because that created a magnificent control system that has never been duplicated. Never been duplicated. As a matter of fact, it has only been replicated one time that I know of, and I'm usually pretty current on most issues in this country, psychological, sociological, history, and educational in this country. Only one time it's been duplicated. It was duplicated in the 1950s. The communists duplicated it in Korea. They call it brainwashing. Now, you might ask, what is brainwashing? Now, typically, people in the 1950s, when it happened in the Korean War, we talked about brainwashing. See, now, I was a safety and survival engineer for my squadron. I was in the Marine Tax Squadron. 
My primary responsibility is to teach my people how to survive. We had a school for brainwashing in Barbers Point, Hawaii. Teach them how to survive. What's brainwashing? Well, most people, at least the guys in the Marine Corps, they thought that, that brainwashing would be some kind of an inhumane way of treating people. That it would, be, uh, it would be no less than pulling out fingernails, driving bamboo splinters between the joints, hanging people up in the cold and castrating them, uh, the, uh, what we call the Chinese water torture. But brainwashing was none of those things. It was none of those things. Brainwashing was simply a very sophisticated form of re-education. And see, for you all in the, in the auditorium this morning, brainwashing, so that you'll always remember, is nothing but group therapy run in reverse. We always remember that. Now, the whole point of group therapy is to bring people together. Brainwashing is to turn it backwards and scatter people apart. And that was very effective in Korea against our troops. And see, now I'm going to show you the different parallel of what happened in 1710 and what happened in 1950, so you can understand the implications of what's happened to black folk in America. Otherwise, you can't deal with the issue. So in 1950, we had approximately 7,000 Americans in, in prison war camps in North Korea and China. 7,000 Americans had been captured and put into war camps before they were subjected to brainwashing. And after they were subjected to brainwashing, starting from the time they were captured, do you know that in that course of time, almost four years, we did not have one single solitary American prisoner to escape from a prisoner war camp. That had never happened in the history of this nation. That you can contain that many soldiers in one, one or two places and never have one to escape. Not one escaped out of 7,000 in almost four years. And to tell you the truth, in some of those camps, they didn't even have fences or walls up. Some of them didn't even have guards and our people could not escape because of the techniques of brainwashing that was used on them. You would say, now, what was, what was, what was happening to them? They were being devastatedly re-educated. And this is the same identical technique that was used in 1710 on black folk. The whole concept of integration was the same thing that today. They scattered them. Now, what happened in Korea? In Korea, the, the, we noticed certain kind of things were happening to the, to, the, to the prisoners. They didn't act like prisoners anymore. See, when a guy got, got when, he, when, he, when he was captured as a prison, the first responsibility was to try to escape, not to participate, not to cooperate with the enemy, not to compromise one's principles. They to always try to fight, resist, and get out, and to compete to help your own people to escape if you can. Didn't happen in Korea. Because you see, brainwashing, reverse technique, of group therapy, first of all, what it did, it divided the soldiers against each other. Divided the soldiers against each other. And there's a whole revolutionary principle that says that a revolution comes when two people get together and begin to conspire. You can never have a revolution or an insurrection on Earth as long as you drive a wedge between the first two people. You drive a wedge between the first two people, you'll never have a revolt. And in Korea, we never had them revolt. Secondly, people can only organize if they get together. But see what, they, what the communists did, they started an information system, a squealing system, an informing system. And what we found in Korea was they had the most massive, widespread information system ever on Earth, where people were recognizing other people or identifying other people who were planning on escaping. And what the communists were doing was telling people, look, you all got a responsibility now as a prisoner. If you hear about another prisoner talking about escaping, it's your responsibility to inform on him and tell on him. And if you do that, we'll reward you. You get an extra candy bar and apple. And once that happens, you see pretty soon, the soldiers didn't know who to trust anymore. They didn't know who to tell anything to. If he was planning on escaping, who did he tell? He didn't know what the other guy's going to turn him in for a reward. And so the organization broke down and black, and they quit communicating and sharing information with each other. Because all of a sudden you were planning on an escape, next day someone drags you out in the cold, strips you down, and pours ice water on you at a 26 below zero because somebody just turned you in for an apple and a piece of candy. 
And see, that's what happened in Meritor's Manumission in 1710, when blacks were being rewarded for turning in other blacks. See, also what it does, it not only, not only does it now stop your communication, it stops your business, the ability to organize, but also it broke down what we have to have is a sense of community. In none of those camps do they have a sense of community anymore in, in Korea. Without a sense of community, you have no way of, pulling your, of doing the things that have to be done as a human being. And so in the prison war camps in Korea, all of a sudden the camps became filthy, the black camps. Nobody built latrines. Nobody made sure there was food and blankets passed out. Nobody took care of the sick. Because you don't have a community anymore. Without a community, you can't do anything. So we didn't have a community in Korea, in the camps. And out of 7,000 prisoners you had in, in Korea, almost half of them died. They didn't die because anybody shot them. They died from the fact that they were, they were un unable to function appropriately to take care of themselves, to function as a community. They no longer had what you got to have and what black folk had taken from them through meritorious manumission. See, once you get a community, the next thing you must have above that you, is your trust. You cannot have trust if you don't have a community. And I always hear black folks say, Dr. Adams, all the things you say are true, but how can I get, get another black when I don't trust them? You don't trust them because you don't have a community. And you can't get, you can't, and above trust comes cooperation. But Dr. Adams, I don't, I don't want to work with him. No, because you don't trust him. So it goes community, trust, cooperation. And that's what they did in Korea. They killed the community, the black soldiers no longer had community, and prisoners no longer had a sense of a community. They had, no longer had a sense of who they were, what they were about, the business of, and who they were. And all of a sudden, that kind of an oppressive system of rewarding people for identifying with the enemy, and that's what the Koreans are doing, saying you reward, you identify with us, and we'll reward you and give you cannon and an apple. And when they started rewarding people, the community was destroyed. And their soldiers fell apart. And over, over half of them died. And so the next thing that happened to them is what also happened to the black community. After 1710, they moved into the thing what we call give up itis. <laughs> All of a sudden, the soldiers in Korea, in those camps, no longer cared about anything anymore. So when I come into the Crenshaw district and I say, why don't you do this? They say, well, we don't care anymore. Same thing happened in the prisoner war camps. The soldiers didn't care. And once they lost caring, they were through. Nobody could save them anymore. And at night, at night, over 40% of those soldiers would pull blankets over their head and just sit there in the corner and die for no apparent reason. Not for physical reasons. It was called give up itis, and you've seen it in hospitals. That's when a person would die long before he's supposed to. And you ask why. When a husband passed and a wife would die six months later, three months later, not for any medical reason, because they no longer have a will to live. And that's what happened in those camps. We lost over, over half our soldiers because they lost their will to live. And see, after meritorious manumission was put on black folk in 1710, black folk, a lot of them began to lose their will to live and to care and be responsible. So jumping back to 1710, so that you understand what brainwashing is and the impact on black folk, I want you all to understand that, that that was a re-educational system so when that happened in 1710, the word spread. And down in uh, Jamaica, there was a fellow named Willie Lynch that heard about it. And he was already running a seasoning school for slaves in the south, in uh, Jamaica. So then he caught a boat and headed for America, headed for Virginia, where the, where the meritorious manumission had been initially uh, enacted. He got there in 1712. And just like the communists did in, did in Korea, he came up with the same expression, gentlemen, I'm here to take care of your needs. I can show you how to do what you want to have done. I can show you how to divide these slaves so they'll never recover, or at least it'll take 300 years before they can do it. So some of you might wonder why I picked in my book the year 2013. This coming year in 2013 would be almost exactly 300 years since Willie Lynch put his methods on black folk. He said it would take 300 years. He said, what I'll do is to show you how you divide blacks. You divide blacks along the lines of skin color. You rig it so every black 
would look at another black skin color first and say, is he a yellow black or black black? And that way you've already divided them. You divide them along the lines of sex so that all of a sudden you have black women joining the feminist movement against their own black men. They're trying to beat them out of jobs and opportunity and visibility to take care of their families. So you divide them along the lines of sex. Then you divide them along the lines of age, where the old turn against the young, the young turn against the old, and say, you're ancient, you're old, I don't want to listen to you anymore. And it worked very effectively. And Willie Lynch put that on them. It's called divide and conquer. Divide and conquer was the same in 1710 as it was in 1950 in Korea. And black folk became invited. And so from 1750 up to about seven, I mean from 1710 up to 1750, the system started going into effect. The social conditioning, the brainwashing of black folk took off full steam then. Because see now, they were very concerned about all these black slaves. We had to control them. And people said, well, how do you control, how, how are we going to control them? And said, the first way, and there are three ways you do it, but the first way is by physical control. Always control a black person physically. That's what slavery is about. The second way of controlling them was called Jim Crowism. Then you control them legally. Then the third way you control them is when we came out of the civil rights movement, which means symbolically. You control them by manipulating symbols. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So they went into the first thing of controlling black folk physically with slavery. By 1750, the black population got up to 34% in America. And they were very concerned about this. Because you see, all these slaves were pouring in across the water, so they started advertising to bring in more immigrants. They said, what we need are more white immigrants to dilute. Remember, I told you the Diversity Act said we must have so many whites. So we got to have an immigration law that bring in more whites to neutralize blacks out, to keep them contained, to keep them in a, as a minority. And we'll, we'll fix it so they love that word minority. They use it all the time and call themselves that. Even though we know the minority means loser. We'll make them, we'll have, turn the world upside down, they'll call themselves loser, loser, loser. <laughs> so by 1750, black population hit 30, 34%, 34%. So what the white society started doing then, it says, we must do what they, they didn't say that then, but the effect was the same. What happened in Korea? We must isolate them. So every Indian treaty from that point on started putting in, con in conclusions, saying that you must also also, stay away from black folk. They built into all the Indian treaties incentives for them not to identify with black folk because they afraid that if Indians and blacks got together, they could overthrow the country. So Indians were given incentives then to turn against black people. And, that, and, and that's why later on you find that the biggest killers of black folk for a long period of time were Indians because they were given, they were given incentives. For instance, if you raided a town or a village, Guess who the first person you run into in the fields? Was a black person. And see, and you had laws because the slave codes of 1705 says a black person could not arm himself. He couldn't carry a weapon. He couldn't carry a tool. He could not raise his hand to defend himself. He could not strike back. So then you say, hey, we got a good guy to raid. I mean, this is like shooting ducks. And the whites knew that. When they put the blacks out in the field, they used blacks for burglar alarms. So every time it was an Indian raid, they the ones that went down first. And that's why all the five civilized tribes in America then became slaveholders. All the five civilized Indian tribes were slaveholders. Not only were they slaveholders, they were slave traders. And more important than that, in all the, in all the, all the treaties, uh, typically in a treaty, they paid the Indians $20 for every runaway slave they would chase down and brought him back. And that's why also when the Civil, when the civil War came, all the five civilized tribes in America fought with the side of the South to prefer slavery because they didn't want to lose their money and wealth either. And I still have blacks running around saying, well, I'm half Indian. <laughs> Nobody wants to be black. I mean, even, even if you as people have been misusing your people too, but you don't want to be it. They'll tell me about how, well, I'm three quarters white. I can't stand black folk, I'm three quarters white. I said, what, why would you want to be white rather than blacks? I said, blacks didn't enslave you. Blacks didn't Jim Crow you. Blacks didn't castrate and lynch you and exploit you. 
And see, that's that upside down that on that, on that would make black folks see things upside down and wrong. It's inappropriate behavior. Inappropriate behavior pattern was instituted on us to make sure we saw everything backwards. That way when we ran, we thought we were running the wrong, right way, we were running the wrong way, and they knew it. And that's why you later hear me tell black folk all over America that my people, black folk, are doing everything wrong. They're not even doing wrong right. <laughs> Because she's everything is pointed upside down for us, so they can't see which way to run. And so at that time, in 1750s, the colonies then tried to figure out how to contain the whole issue. So we got, we, we got our controls in place, we got, we got the social conditioning in place, and, we, and, we, and I think we got blacks pretty well where we need, where we need them. We got them nailed down. Uh, so then they, uh, they, they then started telling England, don't send any more slaves over here to, to make sure it works. The Continental Congress sent all kinds of letters to England saying, don't send any more slaves, we'll make sure our system of control works. But England said, no, I'm going to keep sending because we're, we're getting rich off of it. England said, we're making a fabulous amount of money because, because we set up the Navigation Act in 1650, which says, I don't care what you all produce in America, it must come back to England first to be processed, and you all buy it back from us. And when you buy it back from us, we're going to charge you three or four times the price of it. And so when England decided to have a revolutionary war to break away from England, they didn't put that in the history book, what the real reason they want to break away from England was for. One, because they were scared to death of black folk getting free over here and tying them with the Indians. Two, they wanted, to, they wanted to reverse that whole shipping process, saying that if we made all the products in America, we raised the cotton, the corn, the beans, the rice, and everything, why are we sending it to you and buying it back from you? So that's what the Revolutionary War was over. And plus, that, see, England was also getting rich off the slaves because, see, England was only paying $25, $35 a piece for every slave they were buying on the west coast of Africa. $25 to $35 a piece. But they created a system called capitalism, which says that I also want a 1,500% return on my money and my investment, which means if I pay $25 for a black slave on West Africa, I want to be able to sell them in America for $400 to $500 a piece. And so England was becoming a very rich and powerful nation. Like most of it. But that was on not only England, but you had all the other slave companies, uh, countries became rich. That was Portugal, Spain, England, Germany, and the Arab nations. All of them were becoming wealthy off of black folk, off a combination of two things, taking the, extracting the wealth out of Africa, the material wealth, and selling the human labor. And after the Revolutionary War, the first act of Congress, they, as soon as they set up a Congress in the United States, the first act of Congress said, let's solve this problem with the slaves. So the first thing they did was pass what they call the first Immigration Act that says this is a white nation and the quota on blacks coming in here other than as a slave is zero. Zero, zip, none, nothing. And that stayed in effect until 1966 when it was raised to one half of one percent. And I still see black folk displaying inappropriate behavior. They can't figure out why you, can't get, why you cannot get Haitians into the country. I said, God knows, don't you know what your law is? The reason you cannot get Haitians into the country is because they're still fearful of you getting a large, significant black population and being a threat to the society. I said, anytime you got boats floating around off, of, off the west coast of Africa for three months, you had over 3,000, 4,000 blacks on there who were sick, starving to death. Not one single country off to bring them in, not this country. At the same time, this country has had refugee programs for every racial and ethnic extraction on earth but black folk. And where is our civil rights leaders? Where is our black leadership? Why aren't they raising issues about it? Instead of them going down there and saying, why, don't, why can't blacks come in from the islands and from Haiti? They do the same thing because they're seeing things upside down and backwards. They do the same thing the whites do. They say, well, what we need to do is, is invade that country and make them stay there. Let's improve the conditions there. And so that way they have nice places there. Rather than say, no, no, you didn't improve all the conditions in Mexico, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, and Hungary, and all these other countries when the people came in. You didn't improve all the conditions in Vietnam to bring in the people. Why do you keep asking these special things black? No leadership will raise the questions. Because you see, no black leadership in America wants to raise the real issues about why we cannot raise our population and others can in a social democracy where the majority will win and the minority will lose. We are the only, 
We are the only planned, systematically, permanently classified minority. Which means that we are the only people who will always lose based on immigration laws and the quotas coming into this country. Unless we start to develop some very specific ways of dealing with it, that's what powernomics is about. I start telling you, you got to start changing the rules, turn things back upside down. You got to always practice how do you get to be the majority. Never do anything where you're going to be a minority. Do it where you're going to become the majority. Don't move to be a minority, move to be a majority. And we're going to talk about that a little later on, on how you play these games and learn how to win in powernomics. But you see, as I said, by, the civil, by, by 1790, the law had locked us out as the only permanent loser. And they said that anybody losing the society from now on, it would be black people. They're the only people that cannot increase their population significantly to be a threat to this country. By, 17, by the late part of the 1790s, they said, we need, they said, what other kind of external controls can we put on black folk? Because now some of them want to learn, some of them want to, want to try to join uh, the religious movement in this country. And, 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 and in religion, we say that everybody's a brother. And uh, if we baptize them how, how, and make them a Christian, how do, how, how, how do we deal with that fact? So they passed a the law saying that Christianity did not relieve your heathenism for a black person. And uh, they did not want, and after that time, that few blacks had been going to church, but they were sitting on sitting in white churches and they had to be monitored and watched, as I told you, because of the Diversity Act. So when the evangelical movement started moving through this country in the turn of the first of the eight, in the 1800s, early 1800s, they said, we let blacks have their churches, but we can always also, but we, but we must pick, the, mon- pick the, uh, the ministers, and we must license the ministers. We must pick ministers that we can control. No black preacher can come into America unless he is controlled by the white establishment, unless he represents our interests and our values, unless he teaches our form of Christianity. Now, this is very important. Why? Because, you see, before, religion was always used to help a population group. When it comes to blacks, we cannot let religion be used to help them. You see, the Catholics, church took after care of all those groups who call themselves Catholics. Jews, priests, took care of the Jews. And even today, you go into, you go into the conflicts in England or Ireland, where you see the Protestants and the Catholics fighting, I guarantee you that the Protestant members, members will be representing their people and protecting them. I guarantee you that the Catholic priests will be representing the Catholics and protecting them. If I take you into the Middle East with the Arabs, I guarantee you Khomeini will be taking care of Arabs. Only in America can I find black ministers who can be bought and sold to be against their own people. (laughs) Nobody else will let you do that. No, No population will tolerate that except our people, and that's what I call inappropriate behavior. Inappropriate behavior pattern when you let your own minister sell you out. It's not in your best interest. What I mean by sell you out is because by the early 1800s, the whites said, well, we're going to have black ministers. We're going to have to Christian them to make sure they do what we want to have done. They must teach Christianity the way we want it taught, to where it is an external control device on black folk. They said, what are the rules? One, that every minister we license must teach black folk. And when you talk about the slave and the master in the Bible, that you're talking about the white man and the black man on earth. Two, you must teach black, the minister must teach black folk that they're to be loyal, faithful, obedient, respectful, and all those other good things, and honest, so that white people don't have to worry about them stealing as a slave. Because you know black slaves had a nasty habit of going around stealing scraps of food because they were starving to death. They were telling me they must be industrious. But you see, white folks wanted you to work a little harder. So they used the term, he's a lazy slave. Now, anybody in his right mind got more than a third grade education would say, why would a slave want to be industrial? <laughs> why would you want to work hard as a slave? What's in it for you? Are you going to get released early? You going to get a pension? <laughs> Social Security or retirement? But they always got this thing about, why, he's a lazy slave. I even got a black writer writes about that day. Part of the problem is the blacks were lazy slaves. He should have been lazy. (laughs) 
The third thing they put on you is that, well, the black ministers must also teach them to get pie in the sky after death. It's going to turn their world upside down. So while everybody else is competing to get resources, to get wealth, to get power, black folk are saying, I'm waiting for mine in the sky. <laughs> they said, well, the role model would be Jesus Christ. Said, yeah, uh, Jesus Christ and all the Jews were very powerful people and had money. Solomon was the richest man on earth. You go look at Matthew, I think Matthew 23, when they start talking about the talent. But the different slaves had talents. And two of them went out and developed their talents and multiplied and made something. And one buried and hid his. Because they knew that would be that black one, it would be that last one, go out and hide it. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, but during that period of time, though, in the 1800s, when all this, they started putting all the religion on them, they started controlling them. A few blacks said, well, wait a minute now, because something just happened down in Haiti. Now, I know that I, I can guess in the future y'all aren't going to let the Haitians into this country, but in the 1800s, what happened was Toussaint Overture. Toussaint Overture took his little band of rabble-rousing blacks in Haiti and beat the devil out of all the French troops. Beat the random raggedy. Beat the devil out of them. Now, that was important because, for two reasons. First of all, that is the only time in Western history where the white society blinked and black folk took advantage of them and beat them. Y'all remember that. Only time in history that, that blacks ever broke free of that conditioning system I told you in 1710, the same way they used again in, uh, World War, in the Korean War. And again, the reason I want to point out that system to you, that, that brainwashing system, why is it so important? You all remember this, now why it's so important? And that's why I must give the dominant white society praise for this. I mean, they're some very smart people. Very smart. Why did I say that? They're very, because, you see, the people that put that system on black folk in 1710, they had the equivalent of a third or fourth grade education. And here we are today, 250 years later, or 200 some years later, almost 300, and black folk with doctor's degrees and master's degrees came and figured it out. <laughs> now, but little Tucson Overture down in Haiti, he won his battle, beat him good. Now, that meant when he beat him, though, they finally tricked him and said, well, now that, we, uh, that you've beaten us, wouldn't you like to come together and integrate? He went to discuss it with them at a meeting. They captured him, put him on a boat, and shipped him to uh, someplace in, in Europe, uh, some country in, 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 in Iceland, in one of those, I think Finland or someplace, and it froze him to death up there in the prison. Because he went, and went to co-op, and I told you in Korea. In the Korea, in the brainwashing techniques, there's another principle that says that anytime you want to control anybody, I can control anybody who's willing to talk and compromise and discuss with me. I can get him to compromise. And see, what we should have tried to teach our soldier was a call, call a code of conduct in Korea, which says never, never talk to your enemy unless it's on your turf and your terms. And see, right now, what, I, what I'm assistant, assistant police commissioner, I'm working as a therapist for, for prisoners. Anytime I get somebody to communicate and talk with me, I got him. If he'll speak to me and answer my questions, I got him. Sooner or later, he's going to break down and tell me what I want him to what I know. The way you resist you don't communicate, you don't compromise your principles. They can never beat you then. And see, and that's how they got overture. They asked him, don't you want some integration? It's like they told our leaders the same thing. Now, there were some other blacks who jumped up and said, I'm not going to go for that okie doke. One of the first ones in 1800 was, uh, was Gabriel Prosser. Gabriel was an extremely smart black guy. He says, I just heard about what Toussaint Overture did down in the islands. And say, if Toussaint can do it, I'm going to do it here. He said, I'm going to do the same thing. And he did some planning, and you couldn't believe. He worked, he planned, he schemed. Toussaint, well, I mean, uh, I mean uh, Prosser really worked on his thing. 
and he planned one of the most devastatingly, strategically well-planned insurrections on earth. Now, but before I tell you what he did, let me go back and make this point. I tracked between 1710 and 1860, and we had a possible 150 to 200 possible slave revolts. And in all 150 to 200 of them, a black person squealed in every one of them and got his meritorious manumission and his Willie Lynch badge card. And so when Prosser was trying to pull his together, he planned his scheme. And on the day he was supposed to have his big revolt, would you believe one of the most severe storms that had ever hit Virginia came in and washed out most of the land and roads and bridges and Prosser's group couldn't get together at that gathering point because they were planning on hitting three things. They were planning on taking over the penitentiary in Richmond. They were planning on taking over the armory, and they were planning on attacking the town and annihilating the town, everybody except the Methodists and the Quakers, who had befriended them. And the storm struck just as they were going to assemble. And only 300 showed up, and Prosser said, well, since only 300 of us here, let's put it off until next week, when the land is dry and clear. And within three days, a black person squealed. Prosser was arrested, along with 35 of his supporters, they were executed, hanging, heads chopped off, and put on poles. But the two blacks that did the squealing, one was called Tom, the other was called Pharaoh. And I don't know, God knows it, because I don't know, why is it when you name a black person Tom, you almost guess he's going to do something. Now, I don't know, and I don't mean to put down anybody here named Tom, but I don't know something about that name. <laughs> and Pharaoh itself is not too much of an exciting name. I wouldn't trust that name either. If somebody my mother named me Pharaoh, I'd know I'm in a world of trouble too. But anyway, Tom and Pharaoh turned in Prosser. They, they executed Prosser, chopped his head off, along with some other, and hung him up on, on poles. But the thing that, that, that became very important in that case, though, was that the town was really fearful because they found out from rumors that Prosser had lined up somewhere between five and 50,000 slaves. The whites all through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, was paralyzed. Their mouths fell open, their eyes they popped, and they said, oh, something is wrong. You mean tell me we put a conditioning system on black folk where we turn everything upside down, and this black, this black guy was able to do the impossible? Without an education, something is wrong with our system. What's wrong? And I'm serious. This was a big issue. They had to find out how this one black guy get together as a slave and have something between five and 50,000 blacks ready to fight and had not been for a storm, they'd have taken over the country. And finally came out to another rumor, speculations, that what it was was that he had beat the symbolism. To show you how important symbols are, that's why I keep telling about powernomics. To get out of your system, sometimes you're lost. You look up at a mountain, you look up at a peak, you look for the Penobscot building or the Empire State Building, you find your symbol, you can find your direction. And what that black done, Pross had done, he looked at the state seal. The state of Virginia had a seal where it had a white man lying prostrate and a black man's foot on his chest. The white and the black guy was called, Ver and in, in the seal it said, Verticus overcomes Tyrannus. And that black man had used that seal as his motivating force, his guiding light for his people. And when whites found that out, immediately they changed the Virginia seal and said, get rid of that seal fast. <laughs> and put up guards around the capital to make sure it didn't happen again. Now that was in, that was in 1800. By 1821, another black named V.C. got equally as concerned. He had heard about it. He said, he's going to try it in South Carolina and try another revolt. But V.C. says up front, V.C. organized his group. He walked around. He was a free black. He got free because he bought his own, paid, his, paid $600 and freed himself. He won money in a lottery. But he's very upset because he couldn't buy his children out of slavery. So V.C. would walk through the town in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina, telling black folk, get that hump out of your back. 
Straighten up. Be respectful. Take care of your own people. Look out for your own people. Quit trying to worry about everybody and look out for yourselves. And VC was very, he was a big man too, a big broad man. He said, I'll break your back if I catch you bending over. And he planned an insurrection. And he called something like about three to 500 together to take over Charleston, South Carolina. But he told them up front, he said, let me tell you all something. He says, if I catch one black in this group trying to get meritorious manumission, he said, I'm gonna snap your neck like a twig. And he planned a revolt. And unfortunately, again, two days before his revolt was supposed to occur, not only was he squealed on once, he was squealed on twice. So VC was picked up along with about 37 of his people and hung. Because again, they sold him out. Then by 1831, Nat Turner, you already know about, tried the same thing a few years later in 31. Nat Turner says that I'm not even going to go through those changes. I'm not going to do what VC did. I'm not going to do what Prosser did. I'm not even going to play that silly game. He said, what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to break out of here. I'm getting me a knife, gun, sword, stick, tools, bricks, anything I can get. I'm killing anything I see that moves, crawls, jumps, walks, or talks. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm, I'm quoting him. He says, I'm, he's, I'm the rod and staff of God. I'm not playing these silly games. I'm tired. And so, so Turner started walking, saying he was a sword and the voice of God. And he said, I'm going to kill anything I see moving. He killed 55 people, including his own master. And then the country got petrified again and sent the, sent the army in looking for him. They searched for, they searched for that Turner for two months and couldn't find him. He hid out because he killed so many people. Until one day he needed food and went down to get some, some, some blacks to get some food. And guess what happened? Turned him in. And so that took care of Nat Turner. Same time, there's one other black, though, which is my hero. I don't know how much time I got. How much? As long as, you want. As, long as I want. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You see, you all are so nice. That's why I love coming to this city. Boy, I swear. I love you. I, 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 I'm going to move out here pretty soon. <laughs> um, but, but my hero is John Horse. We start talking about inappropriate behavior versus appropriate behavior. Now, here's a black man at the same time period displayed what I call appropriate behavior. No Rodney King stuff, you see? John Horse was a runaway slave who would also run off to, south, to, south, uh, to Florida in the early 1800s during the same period when V.C. And, and Turner and the rest of them were trying to revolt. John Horse was a big, burly, strong black man. He ran off to Florida. Contrary to what you hear all the time in, in, you know, in the media about the Underground Railroad, all blacks trying to get north, get to the, get to the promised land. That's a part of that myth. Most blacks weren't that dumb. Why would they want to go all the way across the no go to the north a thousand miles to a hostile white country when they could run off to Florida, which is Spanish territory, 20 miles away or two feet away? <laughs> so some of the smarter blacks of our relatives ran off to Florida because that was Spanish territory. And they got down in the interbred and intermixed with the Seminole. Now, you all might ask me why about Seminole. Now, Seminoles were also against blacks, a lot of them, but a lot of them were not. Seminoles were the most receptive blacks, receptive Indians to do anything with blacks in the country. Why? Because you see the word Seminole means runaway slave. Okay? And they were also runaways. They interbred with blacks. They were a mixture of blacks. So they were very receptive to black folk. And so they started fighting in that area to fight the United States because the United States didn't want to go down there and try to get the slaves black, back. And they sent, that's what they were sending General Andrew Jackson to Florida for to get the slaves. Because you see, blacks down there were coming across the border periodically with the Indians raiding and killing whites and getting their people free. Now, why is that important? Because you see, when I talked about early inappropriate behavior in Africa, the reason they enslaved black folk originally was because our leaders in Africa had given the impression that I don't care about other black folk. And they hauled all those blacks around the world because they knew in their hearts they would never see a shipload of Africans coming to get them back. 
They never suspected that Africans would come to save Africans. But that's why they didn't try to enslave Indians, because they knew if they didn't enslave Indians, Indians would come get their people. But they knew that black leadership in Africa had already said, you can have them, I don't want them, I won't come to get them. And so when the blacks went off into, in the, in the south, in the, in, the, in the Florida, they were coming across the border, raiding those, those, those plantations along Alabama and the Georgia border there, South Carolina border, taking their people, sending it, taking them back to South, I mean, down to Florida, getting them free. Uh, but John Horse was a leading hero to me. Now, this black hooked up, he became sort of like the, uh, the second in charge in Africa, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Florida. The chief at that time, in, in, during the 1820s and 1830s, was a, a chief named Osceola. Osceola had about three sons that were very active also, fighting uh, white intrusion into, into, into Florida to get the slaves back. His number one son was, uh, uh, was a white, uh, I mean, a mixture of black and white. His name was a Wildcat. And Osceola himself, if you all don't know it, Osceola was married to a black woman. You might see Osceola's pictures in all the museums as an Indian. They don't ever tell you that he was married to a black woman and had a mixed group. And he married him to a black woman. A black woman's name was Morning Dew, if you're interested in knowing it. Morning Dew was the one, and that's what triggered the Seminole Wars. They don't tell you that in the history books either. So going back and forth down there, they were trying to, uh, trying to get the Indians back. I mean, trying to get the slaves back from the Indians. And, uh, and they kept sending the, the federal troops in there. And Andrew Jackson was one of the, one of the primary generals that always wanted to go out there and fight Indians. He loved to fight Indians. He's known as the Indian fighter. And that's why you have Jacksonville, Florida, because he was going in there, again, fighting Indians and try, trying to get blacks back. And, and on the Chattahoochee River, right outside Tallahassee, they had a fort there called Fort Negro, where most of the blacks were living, staying there. And they sent the federal troops down there to, to, to get the, the slaves back. Then the, uh, the federal boat came up the Chattahoochee River to Fort Negro, and most of the blacks were out with the Indians raiding and fighting and, uh, and left the women and kids there. And so the troops, uh, the federal troops fired on Fort Negro, one shot, and a shot rolled into the, uh, into the armory and set off the explosion and blew up the entire fort and was nothing in there but black women and children. And that, and that really made them hostile. The blacks were hostile this time. So now, they, so, so then they, that, that triggered the second Seminole War. After that, uh, they decided to have a truce they said, we have a truce if we can we sit down with, with, with Osceola and his, soul, and his warriors, John Horse and the rest of them. And at that point in time, they met. Uh, before they met, they went and kidnapped Morning Dew and told uh, Osceola that if you want your wife back, you better turn some of those black slaves loose and meet with us. And when Osceola went to the meeting to, uh, to discuss getting his wife back, they kidnapped him and put him in prison. I think up in Fort Sumter, South Carolina, he died of consumption and exposure. And uh, so at that point in time, John Horse and, and Wildcat went berserk. Then they started fighting. They fought all the way throughout Florida and finally they ran them out of Florida. They went out west and led some of, the, some of the, that mo whole movement called the Trail of Tears all the way out to Oklahoma Territory. And, uh, but the only people who were fighting in this country against the United States at that time was, was John Horse and Wildcat and his band of blacks. They had carried their own women and kids with them. That is the only black man in the history of this nation, and I'm sorry to say no school teaches that. That's the only black man in America that's ever stood up to America and fought, it, fought him, and not as a slave, but as a man. Nobody else has ever done it. <clears throat> John Horace fought the, United, fought the United States for 50 years. They fought him all out west. They chased him all down through the west, through Oklahoma through Texas, and finally chased him into Mexico. He went into Mexico and stayed there for, not, for about five or six years and came back again, he and, he and Wildcat. They tried to set up their little village again, but the whites out there, the racists kept, kept raiding, their, raiding their camps, shooting them and killing them. He kept fighting, and they finally killed Wildcat, shot him in the back with a shotgun and killed him. And then the John Horse finally just gave up and got on his horse, allegedly, and just rolled off back into Mexico. You never heard from him again. But he fought for 50 years, the only black man. You can talk about any civil rights leader you want to. If you had a hero, that's the only hero we ever had that fought and says, I'm not a slave and I won't take it. I'm not Rodney King or anybody else. 
And so, but it, and they found, nobody ever knew what, knew what happened to him, but he rolled off. That was John Horse. Now, the, uh, now this whole meritorious manumission policy is in effect, moving along at the same time, this control system. About 1852, a lady named Harriet Beach Stover began to want to write about it. So she then wrote about the whole thing. She interviewed a guy whose name uh, was Henson, which you all know as Uncle Tom. He then told about the story. She wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. But in that book, contrary to what most people think, Uncle Tom was not the bad guy. The bad guy was Sambo. And so I'm asking you all as my brothers and sisters, please in the future don't call a black guy who you know is worthless and trifling. Don't call him an Uncle Tom. That's complimenting him. Call him his real name, what he's entitled to, and that's a Sambo. Any black person, <laughs> any black person sells his own people out and, and, and will do them in, he is a Sambo. Now, what is a Sambo again? Going back to Meritorious Manumission in 1710, the whole conditioning process the whole brainwashing system, the whole social engineering system says that you must teach black people to see eyes, see the world through the eyes of whites. You must see everything through their eyes. You must accept their values, their superiority, whatever they think and feel, and that way you are, we got you contained. And that's why when you see somebody like Colin Powell to my running for office, they say, well, you can run for office if you see the things the way we want to see them. If you want to be conservative, you can run for office. If you want to place a lot of importance on abortion, you can run for office. If you want to talk about being anti-tax, you can run for office, which means if you see things the way we see them as a black person, you're safe. You're acceptable. And if you don't want to do that that way, then become an athlete or an entertainer. So therefore, you don't you identify the rest of those blacks in the country. You stay away from them. They're bad. And you start going out and you try to go get a, try to go get a penny out of an athlete and entertain do something for the black community. They're going to do it. Their advisors won't let them do it. Their agents won't do it. Their promotion people won't let them do it. They're going to identify with your community because, again, they have, they have now already died and gone to heaven. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so, when, so when Harriet Beecher Stowe put out her book, what she tried to tell black folk is that Uncle Tom was not a bad guy. See, Uncle Tom, you read that book, and most black, 90% of blacks never read it. They always call another black, he's an Uncle Tom, he's an Uncle Tom. He's not an Uncle Tom. If you read the book Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom was a guy who would not beat black women. Uncle Tom, that book, was a, was a guy who would not beat other blacks to make them pick more cotton. Uncle Tom was a guy who would come in at night and take cotton out of his own bag and put it in other black folks' bags so they wouldn't get whippings at night. Uncle Tom was a guy who would not tell where black folk were hiding when they went across the river and they broke free as slaves. But, but Simon Legree, the white slave master, had a black to follow him around named Sambo, who always says, you show me, give me the right, I'll show you how to trees the coons. I'll show you where they hides. And see, and that's the guy. See, his role of responsibility was going back to meritorious manumission. I told you about where you got to protect white folks' property and protect their wealth. He says, I will protect it and find it for you. And that's why you read in those, in the, in the movies and books that came out after Uncle Tom, you always had a black guy, a black slave, was running down the road saying, Master, Master, here comes the army. Let's hide our silver and gold. <laughs> and you all said, our? <laughs> How did it get to be our? <laughs> you know, he always wanted to say something that doesn't even belong to him. And that showed up all through history. And today you got the same kind of personality doing it. And now he's not saying, let's hide our silver and gold. He's called himself a conservative. I'm also against affirmative action for black folk. I'm against quotas. I'm against preferential treatment. Even had one running around talking about he wanted to pass a law to stop black folk from discrimination against whites. You still got that kind of personality that always wants to protect something, protect the strong. You always got that kind of Sambo personality. And nowadays, the best way to get rich is to say, I'm going to, I'm going to practice that master's gold and silver, and I'm going to be against them black folk. I guarantee I can get you a radio talk show. I can get you a television show. I can even get you an appointment to the Supreme Court. Okay.
You tell me how many black folk you want to sell out, and I guarantee I'll show you how to make money. Because you see, every ethnic group, every religious group, every racial group, every political group has always made money off of black folk. Okay? And what I'm going to start talking about in Powernomics when I come back here in the fall is to show you all one thing. I'm going to tell you if time is up. You have made, as a race, you made every religion, every ethnic group, every racial group rich. There is nobody else left on earth to make rich but yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all left. We got to do it for ourselves now. So don't give me this stuff about Dr. Answer. Well, that, that, well, that, that, that's the reverse discrimination. We, 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 are, we are anti. You ain't anti nobody. You already made everybody rich. <laughs> they always tell me, well, uh, well, Dr. Anderson, uh, what you're preaching is, isn't that, a, isn't that a, a segregation? Or let me tell y'all something. Starting again, back in 1850, blacks got hung up on that same mess, you know? By 1850, after, after uh, uh, Harriet Beach Stover put out her book, here comes Frederick Douglass, he's going to take one path. He's going to go back now and try to pick up becoming an integrationist. He becomes an integrationist, picking that, he wants, well, since they excluded us in 1638, saying we should never be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society, let's be integrationists and civil rights people. Let's make them let us in. So they started, they started that top strand called integrationists, which are run Frederick Douglass, um, uh, Booker T. Washington, then up to all your, all your civil rights leaders and Martin Luther King and that whole group, all the way down the line to even your present day civil rights groups. They keep saying, we want access to whatever you own. We want to be included in whatever you own. Now you got another group that started after, after, after the book with uh, Harriet Beach Stover. They said they want to be segregationists. Then you got the more strongly willed persons like W.B. Du Bois. Then you got uh, Martin Delaney. You got Marcus Garvey. Uh, <laughs> then you got Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. They were going the other way saying, no, we want our separate stuff. Now, what I say by myself, and I know I, a lot of people might get upset when I say it, both groups were right and both groups were wrong. What I say is that it is not about integration. It is not, the issue is not segregation. The issue is congregation. Con it means aggregating. What it is is called functional pluralism, which means we're not trying to integrate, we're not trying to segregate. No other group comes here and says, I want to integrate or segregate. What they're saying is that if I come together and concentrate as a people, concentrate my power and my wealth and my resources, I can compete. That's what they're talking about. And please, as I love all of you all, and I'm going to move here with you, don't let them trick you all anymore with them upside down glasses. They, they used to ask me that during integration about Dr. Anderson. Now, hold it. Now, you're, in, you're at the governor's office in Florida. You represent the whole state in education. Now, what do you want during integration? Do you want, you got Malcolm X talking about segregation. You got Martin Luther King talking about integration. Why don't you all make up your mind? Which do you want? I said, I don't want either one. I want the same rights and privileges that everybody else got to go to either one of the sticks. Don't try to put me on one end of the stick. 